Okay, hello everyone, good evening. So thank you for coming. Uh, my name is Catherine Rankin. I am the director of the planning program and associate chair in the Department of Geography and Planning. And uh, we begin by acknowledging that our disciplines, planning and geography, as key forces of settler colonialism and imperialist occupation and domination have a difficult history in relation to the, la to the lands on which we work. And that specifically, the land on which the University of Toronto operates has for thousands of years been the traditional land of the Huron-Wendat, the Seneca, and the Mississauga of the Credit. Today, this meeting place is still the home to many indigenous people across Turtle Island, and we are grateful for the opportunity to work on this land. So there's an expanded version of the U of T land acknowledgement on the First Nations House website, and that, um, and that site adds the following. It says, this sacred land has been a site of human activity for 15,000 years and was the subject of the Dish with, with One Spoon Wampum Belt Covenant, an agreement between the Iroquois Confederacy and the Confederacy of the Ojibwe and allied nations to peaceably share and care for the resources around the Great Lakes. So 15,000 years of human activity sharply contrasts right with the 150th birthday of Canada in 2017 and the recognition of the Dish with One Spoon Treaty implicitly reminds us uh, of our obligation and that of other residents on this land to take care of the land, right? And this is an apt injunction for planning. So it's a pleasure to be here this evening to welcome everyone to the University of Toronto and to the uh, Bowsfield Distinguished Visitor in Planning Public Lecture uh, with our special guest, Professor of Practice, Adriana Beemans. <laughs> so I'd like to take a moment uh, to acknowledge John Bowsfield, in whose honor the Distinguished Visitorship in Planning was established as well as colleagues from the firm that takes his name, Bowsfields Incorporated, which is a preeminent community planning firm in Ontario. I'm sure you know that. Um, is the Bowsfield contingent here tonight? Ah, welcome. Um, and uh, I also take this opportunity to acknowledge a former instructor in the planning program uh, whose name is Mitch Goldar whose generosity together with that of the Glenn Corporation, Greywood Developments, the estate of James Stewart, and the U of T Connaught Fund make this visitorship and this evening's event possible. So this visitorship, uh, this uh, John Bowsfield Distinguished Visitorship in Planning was established at our department, Geography and Planning, to pay tribute to one of North America's foremost urban planners, in a career that spanned five decades, John Bowsfield was consistently at the forefront of Toronto's most groundbreaking community and land use planning projects. And the purpose of the visitorship, as you may have gathered, is to integrate real world practice of planning more closely with academic teaching and research. And, um, to do so in a way that kind of critically engages students at an important point in their career as aspiring planners. So students have an opportunity to interact in stimulating debates and cutting edge ideas and, um, with thinkers and practitioners, developers and local planners through a broad spectrum of activities of which this is one. And the intent is to help them to help to prepare them to meet the challenges of an increasingly complex and rapidly changing city and, and field. Okay. The visitorship is also an extraordinary opportunity for our faculty and local uh, planning community to benefit from hearing from and collaborating with 
accomplished practitioners. And we've had folks from around the world, and we're so pleased to have a colleague with us today who's made a commitment to this place, to Toronto. I guess the, maybe the real importance of the Bellsfield Distinguished Visitorship is that it creates a forum that draws people together. So it's so wonderful to see that happening right now. Um, people, members of the planning community to share their experience and stimulate debate and open new ch channels of dialogue and ultimately we hope to improve planning practice and solve problems. So it's my distinct privilege, therefore, to introduce tonight's speakers and one of this term's several Bassfield Distinguished Visitors, Professor of Practice Adriana Beemans. And undoubtedly, her talk will elicit all of the above that I've said. The title is before you. Um, I'll say a few words about Adriana. She leads the Inclusive Local Economies Program at the Metcalf Foundation, which is a private foundation engaged in helping Canadians imagine and build a just, healthy, and creative society. So Adriana has come to this work through an extraordinary path of service and engagement with communities. Um, uh, uh, and she's done that having worked um, before Metcalf at the Working Women Community Center, where she led the establishment of Victoria Park Community Hub. Toronto Community Housing, where she supported participatory budgeting, uh, among other kind of modes of community engagement. The Aga Khan Foundation in Pakistan, UN Habitat in Afghanistan, incredibly, during the first regime of the Taliban, where, uh, where she led negotiations with the Taliban Ministry of Labor and Social Affairs, if you can imagine to ensure uh, the continued operation of Afghan-led women's community forums. I should also not omit that uh, Adriana is a graduate of the U of T uh, and holds a Master of Arts in Political Science and Environmental Studies, which was co-supervised by Richard Stren and Pamela Robinson, who's here today. Um, so, uh, quite an extraordinary path to, to this moment. Anyways, as director of Inclusive Local Economies and Metcalf, Metcalf, and I should also acknowledge that Metcalf colleagues are also here and welcome you in particular. Um, Adriana now works with and invests in the nonprofit and community based sector to advance innovative ideas for workforce development, decent work community wealth, and capacity building. As many of you know, Adriana is an incredibly strategic thinker who derives uh, principles for practice through collaboration and partnership and sets them to work, right? To create vision and, and also in a kind of diagnostic way to hold the, the, those experiments to account. And this is a remarkable role, I think, for a foundation to play. It has gone a long way toward building a constituency, in fact, this constituency, of nonprofits and community-based organizations in Toronto that are, are well-positioned, right, and networked to advance inclusive economy work. And Adriana, Adriana has this extraordinary co uh, commitment to engaging this constituency as resources, right, for thinking through debates. Um, should we make this, the existing economy more equitable or build a new economy, right, that is more localized to test ideas about, you know, about how to create alternatives and alternative economic spaces? Or sh should we increase people's ability to work when they live in poverty so they get just a little more? Or should we work toward creating better jobs? And, and decent work to help people get out of poverty. So these are the questions, these are the kinds of questions that are debated in the community economic development literature, but Adriana has put them into action toward building a kind of a strategic uh, philanthropy for systems change. Strategic philanthropy for systems change. This is an extraordinary contribution and um, has, you know, joined ambitious goals to link up distinctive 
local economy projects and programs with far-reaching and ambitious goals, right? Like shifting resource flows, changing the quality of work, and crucially changing um, what, what you call, Adrienne, in mental maps, I think of more like ideology, um, and policy. So um, as many of you know, uh, Adriana, Adriana also has a kind of knack for s distilling strategic thinking into compelling um, kind of pedagogical tools that things like, um, and you've probably heard some of these, um, the, the three S's of grant making or plugging leaky buckets to keep capital in community or um, navigating competing timelines of different ambitions. So I um, feel that we're super fortunate, all of us, to hear her you know, share her latest thoughts um, and insights on community-based struggles for an inclusive local economy. And with that, I'd like to turn the proceedings over to you, Adriana. Thanks, Catherine. Is this on? Ooh, it's on. I have a pocket and everything. Um, so thank you. Thank you very much for being curious and coming here tonight. Uh, it's great to see uh, so many faces. It feels like a little bit of like a work wedding almost <laughs> of, uh, of folks and stuff. So it really means uh, a lot. Um, I start off with sharing the seven grandfather teachings. These are Anishinaabe principles that talk about what it means to live a good life and actually what communities need to survive. And it's right around the school uh, from where I live. It's the school that my son goes to, and he was part of making this mosaic. And over COVID, it became part of my daily walk of looking by. And these principles have become part of my decision-making practices. And I think through how do they guide my decisions when I have challenges? How do they help my choices with my family? And really, they play out a lot in my grant making. And I think about projects, and I think how am I supporting bravery, or what's courageous in the work, and where does the wisdom lie, and how does love for community and justice play out? So I want to start off with kind of grounding ourselves in these principles. And this is just, up the, just off Dufferin, up the road uh, from what, the lake, Lake Ontario. And that used to be the carrying, called the carrying place, the gather, no, the carrying place. Um, and that was where uh, it was the start of um, interconnected paths and river routes and portages that connected First Nation communities over generations. And it connected indigenous communities all the way up north to Lake Superior and all the way south uh, down to Mexico. And so I really think about place and I think about the place of where I am in Toronto and the city that I've really come to love over these years. And I think about place even before Toronto and how it goes all the way back. And the woodland that surrounded my neighborhood when it was the, called the carrying place. So I just want to ground myself first in the land and give gratitude to it. And I also want to give gratitude to Bousfield. Bousfield? 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 Bousfield. Uh, and uh, to the University of Toronto Planning and Geography Department. Uh, for selecting me and engaging with me over this time, and especially to the Metcalf Foundation for everything. Uh, so it really means a lot for me to be here and for all of you to come here. Uh, it's, uh, it's, quite a, it's quite an honor to be able to share my thoughts. Rest assured, uh, I will not talk two and a half hours straight. It is possible, but I will not do it. Uh, my plan is to give a little bit of context framing about the framework that I'm working through and share four stories, uh, and then hopefully have some conversations uh, afterwards. So uh, this year marks uh, the 10 year anniversary of my time with the Metcalf Foundation, and I am one for milestones. Uh, and I thought it was an opportune time to rest, uh, reflect, uh, and pause, and to share knowledge. And part of it was, as I came here, I realized that it's actually, while I feel like the community work is so clear and vivid in my world, because I've been working on it for so long, it's actually not something that really is visible to others. Because this work is sometimes really hyper-local, uh, at micro scale, it's hard to get the right unit of analysis for an evidence base, and there's so many other players, so you don't really see the impact of their work. But for me, it's very clear. So what I want to do right now is share with you these four stories that I think 
have significance. One, while it might be a story of one issue, they're actually from a portfolio perspective. So I really looked over at the range of issues on it. Two, to have in commonality, I think they've all had a significant impact in the economy in ways that we don't even realize, at a local scale, but also at a national and systems level scale. And I guess the other key thing is that they are personal to me. I feel like uh, I am part of their story and they are part of mine. And so that I have, a, I have a role in being able to say this voice and I'm not being extractive. So I take the role of being a funder really seriously. Uh, it's a role, responsibility with power and privilege, and I try to balance it with humility and wisdom. And that's why it's such an amazing opportunity to be here and uh, to take off this funder hat that can sometimes feel quite heavy with power and just have a chance to uh, reflect from my own voice. So I want to say in a couple of things, one, any mistakes, errors, or missions, all mine. Definitely not Metcalf and definitely not uh, the community partners. And two, that this is a work in progress. Uh, and so your generosity is lovely in advance. Um, so I'm a community development practitioner. Uh, I work with ideas and actions, uh, people and relationships, and we work through stories. Uh, stories of change, stories of struggle, uh, stories of significant impact that are filled with uh, data. And, uh, and I've worked on the unit of the city of Toronto for 20 years. And it's kind of surprising as someone who thought my world was going to be much more global and international when I started off. But I really actually came thinking about when I came to Toronto 20 years ago, I had this desire for local legitimacy, uh, where I could feel that I had more of a role and accountability and voice. And, uh, and Toronto was one of those cities that I picked because I felt that I was in another world whenever I was here, and working with communities from all over, speaking different languages, made me feel that I was working globally while living in Toronto. Over the 20 years, I've worked probably in most of the neighbourhoods across uh, the city of Toronto with neighbourhood residents, with community organisations, grassroots groups, charities, uh, every kind of non-profit structure there is. Uh, and over this time, I've probably supported uh, definitely with Metcalf, about 100 community projects, hundreds of community leaders, probably read 1,000 1, grant applications and reports, if not that. And I'm really interested to share what those, uh, the data and evidence points that I find from that and the patterns. And it's been interesting being at the university to be able to overlay academic literature over those themes and to see some things that I kind of thought about and then see the language uh, further distilled through the academic literature. So I work in community economic development. That has a range of definitions, but across the board, there's kind of a general understanding that it's activities, policies, and institutions that are focused on improving uh, community well-being and prompting economic opportunities for low-income people. For me, that is still a very broad bucket. And so the organizations that I work with are really fo focusing on uh, exploring and addressing the economic forces and the social structures that reinforce poverty and inequality. And they're focused on addressing those structures uh, and systems. What this means is decent work for low-income workers and low-wage workers. What it means is creating access to good jobs so that people can get out of poverty for marginalized groups. Uh, building community wealth and changing and gentrifying neighborhoods and redistributing and repurposing assets and profits so that low-income people benefit. And in the relationships that I work with, some are short, uh, less than a year, and others last many years, and they span multiple grants, uh, and they really follow projects that go from an evolution of an idea to a deepening of strategy uh, to a development of partnerships. And with that, I've developed really strong friendships through those relationships, and we forge, part we forge partnerships for change. And the work is uh, ranges from the grant impact is significant, but it can range from the granular where you don't really see and a couple of hundred people improved all the way to policy and systems change that really moves the needle on things. And so uh, the stories that I share with you will fo hope, hopefully focus on some of those comp components. Uh, finally, I just want to say that as a funder, uh, again, 10 years with the Metcalf Foundation and five years with Toronto Community Housing, I've had the privilege of supporting about $20 million being invested into Toronto to focus on poverty reduction. So I'm really curious about how do I understand what impact that's had, but also I want to say that it's more than just financial capital. 
It's social capital, connecting organizations with one another, connecting ideas with one another. It's also cultural capital, having different scales of relationships and organizations getting to know each other and working through them. Some of that happens with me, but a lot of that happens uh, beyond my gaze, and that's really important. So this is the framework that I've been really uh, geeking out on. Uh, so Dr. Alnur Ibrahim uh, is an organization evaluation uh, specialist, and he identifies three foundational questions that inform social sector strategy. What do we mean by social sector strategy? And he says these are three core components. The value proposition, what do we seek to achieve? The social change model, how will we bring about change? This is kind of like the operational model. And then accountability, how do we hold our feet to the fire? And what I find really interesting about the accountability is it's not about compliance and upstream responding to funders. It's about identifying what are we going to be accountable for and how are we, who are we going to prioritize our accountability for. So those are two things. What are we going to be accountable for and to whom are we going to prioritize that accountability? And those three things are the fundamental uh, questions that he says we need to look at for social sector strategy. And those are similar to the questions that I ask in my grant making. Uh, I ask around the kind of what is the guiding star that guides this issue? What is the underlying issue that you're trying to focus on? And how do you know that? What is the, tell me about the organization and your origin story. And how does the context of power and system and your analysis frame the issues? And what is the constituency, that accountability part? Who is your constituency and what gives you legitimacy and credibility for the work that you do? So I find these three aspects really interesting. And when I started looking at the social and solidarity economy, which has many, many kind of definitions and they're hard to somewhat understand, but the OECD, uh, OECD had a definition recently for the social and solidarity economy that said it was a set of organizations and named a whole bunch of or types of organizations, uh, co-ops, nonprofits, charities, grassroots groups, social movements, whose activities are driven by social objectives. They have values of solidarity uh, they have this primacy of people over capital, and uh, democratic and participatory governance mechanisms are part of their work. So when I look at those themes in the social and solidarity economy that I've read about being uh, redistributive justice, relational autonomy, and economic democracy, I also see those things echoed in this uh, social change uh, component model. I see in the value proposition around redistributive justice asking about the underlying purpose, the ambition, and how does the political and social way of seeing the world analysis inform your work? Why are you doing this? Why is it important? I see in the social change model, how do we operationalize this? How are we going to work with community? That relational autonomy about redistribution and reciprocity, and how do we navigate and reinforce collective uh, networks and tables, and we build mutual trust. And finally, what does the local look like in your work? And then in accountability, I see that economic democracy about you know, who's the voice in the work? How do we center community? What does community leadership look like? And how is that really grounded in the everyday decisions? To me, those are essential components, both in social change, and it's been interesting to see the academic literature echo those things as well. And so I've been trying to read about the academic literature and how they talk about community, and then see how do I see those patterns reflected in my own work. So one of the things I love about where I work is that we are not beholden to metrics. Uh, we don't have rigid or rigorous measurements of success, and we, part of that is we work with community to understand what they think success looks like. And for me, that is uh, reflective of that social change work, especially around poverty reduction, is really complicated. Social change is contingent on many things. It's part of larger and longer processes. It's both complicated and complex. And there's many, many players. And when you deal with systemic issues around poverty and inequality, you really have to look at those broader factors. And so what I find interesting uh, is Dr. al Noor Ibrahim identifies this contingency framework because he also agrees that social change, uh, social outcomes are usually not isolated actions. Uh, they are multiple and interdependent and interconnected. And usually it's the combination of more interventions that result in greater chance. 
But we also know that it's important to understand success. So even though we don't have rigid measurements, we really want to understand what success looks like in the work. And especially, what does success look like when something has a horizon of 10 to 20 years? This work doesn't happen in two or three years. This is about long-term ambitions. And so how do we think about success when it's long, when it's complex, and when there's many players? And I think for the community-based sector, when there's not a lot of money. What, what's, what's a reasonable expectation to expect from success? So Dr. Al-Nur Ibrahim identifies these two significant constraints that he says most uh, organizations dealing with poverty, addressing poverty and inequality focus on. And those two constraints are uncertainty and control. Uncertainty in that uh, how confident about cause and effect, how confident are we about what we do will work? Are we confident? Will it have the effect that we're intended? Will that outcome take place? And then control. Uh, what control do we have over the activities and the outputs to more likely uh, result in the outcome? I personally find these themes of certainty and control have actually like, echoed through my whole life of, uh, of childhood and, and upbringing, that I have these constraints all the time about certainty and control. So it's interesting to see a framework so nicely organize uh, these components. So within that framework, he says it identifies four types. You see emergent strategy, ecosystem strategy, niche and integrated. And I'm looking at these strategies uh, through the stories of, of our work. And so the four stories I'm going to tell you are two about labor and two about assets. And e Professor Ibrahim says to better understand those types of strategies, you should look at adaptation, orchestration, standardization, and coordination. You should think about them in different ways, because it's not fair to compare one strategy with a completely different type of approach. And I sometimes find that organizations say, everything's emergent, when actually, it's not that complicated. And so it's really interesting to begin to think and ask ourselves in our work, what are the things we can control? What are the things we have influence on? And where is uncertainty in this, in this aspect? I find this really helpful, and, uh, and I hope it's helpful to you. And I hope that it will help me in my grant making, not just the organizations I work with, but actually those that we decline, to help explain why perhaps they need to focus and hone their strategies. So, migrant workers' rights. This is high uncertainty and low control. What do we mean by that? High uncertainty. It is not clear that their advocacy will work. Maybe what worked one time will not work again. So they're, come on in, it's okay. Uh, so it's high uncertainty. You're not sure if it's going to happen again. No guaranteed result. And it's also beyond their control. The policy outcome process isn't within the control. They can do lots of things to try to influence it, but they can't control uh, the policy processes. So what you need to do in an adaptive strategy is you need to adapt. You need to be nimble and you have to be able to be flexible and adjust. And one of the key things that strengthens adaptation strategy is the ability to build relationships and influence others and have a strong systems map that guides your work. The community learning, the Canada Learning Bond, on the other hand, is an example of high certainty and low control. So there is evidence showing that children who have savings are more likely to attend post-secondary education, and they're more likely to graduate from post-secondary education. There is a strong evidence base that connects those two things. But what the Canada Learning Bond does is not have, so there's certainty there, but it doesn't have control on whether people will continue to save or whether they will go to a post-secondary. So what Ibrahim suggests is that we focus on the outputs. So the outputs and increasing the outputs can be very predictive and predicate further uh, outcome success. And so for that, it's about standardization. How do we standardize and have more and more outputs? Workforce development is at a community level. Workforce development at a community level, I would say, is about integrated strategy. And I'll talk a little bit about uh, it from a non-community level. And in, I say integrated strategy because there is higher, uh, there is more certainty about what will work, which doesn't mean that it's easy, but we know what works in good job training, and we know what works in good workplace integrated learning and how to make it happen. It's still complicated, but there's an evidence base that is growing to help us understand what are the components that are required to have strong workforce development and connect low-income people to good jobs. But there is also higher control because 
again, not easy, but you have more control to kind of connect the interventions that are required and to build relationships and sequence and prioritize, combine and coordinate the interventions that are required to achieve the better outcome, which is increasing worker stability and mobility to work out of poverty. Finally, uh, in uh, community wealth, it is high uncertainty. Who knows? how this is gonna work. Long-term neighborhood change is required to build neighborhood economies and support equitable development. This is complex work, and there's no guarantee that what approach happened in Regent Park is the same thing that's gonna happen in another neighborhood. So there's not a lot of certainty about what uh, will work. But there is the ability to assert more control, that with time, you can be able to combine the relationships and the projects and actually a lot of other integrated strategies and orchestrate them in a level of harmony where things can work together and get more some of the parts. And so those are the four uh, components of the social change strategy that I'm going to dive into in more stories now. And it's a work in progress. And uh, one more thing, these are highlights. There are so many things I could say, uh, but then you would never leave and we'd never have snacks. Uh, so we'll just have to talk about it after. So, my first story. Um, my first summer job uh, out of university was working on a farm with migrant laborers. Uh, I worked in southern Ontario. I saw a flyer in uh, the university board. I pulled off a number. It said, hard work, low pay, and an experience of a lifetime. And that sounded great for a 19-year-old. Uh, and the idea was that it was sending... Uh, it comes from a 100-year history. Frontier College used to send laborer teachers out to work on railroads, mining, uh, lumbering, and work with migrant uh, immigrant workers who had come to Canada and got... Uh, residency with it, and worked on building out the components of our infrastructure. And, uh, and Frontier College would place uh, laborer teachers with them, and they'd do literacy in the evening and work next to them at night. Fast forward 100 years later, and Frontier College was sending laborer teachers to work on fruit, vegetable, and tobacco farms with migrant workers. Uh, I worked in Virgil, Ontario. I picked strawberries, peaches, pears, and tomatoes. And I worked about 77 hours a week, uh, which is 12 hours a day, six days a week. And then uh, on Fridays, we only had to work till noon because then we went in the afternoon uh, to buy groceries and got the night off. And, uh, and it was really transformative. I worked with uh, migrant workers, and I heard their stories about feeling disposable, even though they had been here for 10 years, some of them. Their fear of deportation if they complained about their circumstances, as we had pesticides sprayed on us, and our farmer would throw peaches if we dropped them and say, no peaches, no pesos uh, to us. And there was also fear of these tied work permits that stopped them from being able to go and look at better circumstances. And so this summer working with them was transformative. It was catalytic, it changed my identity, uh, it changed my politics, and it really changed my career path. In 1996, we had 52,000 migrant workers through the Temporary Foreign Worker Program. Oh, I have a little thing. Oh, that, I was there. Uh, we had 52,000 workers for the Seasonal Agricultural Work Program. In 2015, we had 310,000 uh, temporary foreign workers and, and workers coming through the International Mobility Program, which is this new one. So that was a new thing that came up. And there's low-wage positions in both. In 2021, according to Statistics Canada, uh, we have now, our labor force significantly relies on temporary foreign workers and international students, and has increased to 777,000 uh, workers that are in Canada under temporary foreign worker and international student permits. So migrant workers are an integral part to our labor force uh, and our economy and our society, but they're also excluded from basic labor rights, protections, education, social services, and health, like the recent announcement just this past week. And, uh, and what's interesting to see is that it has been a long, long process of, uh, of a different history. So this is a timeline, and I'm sure it's incorrect. This really just comes from the granting reports that I reviewed as part of this project. And what you can see here is that although we have almost like a permanent reliance on temporary work, the program in itself has been in a state of constant temporariness. We have embedded a state of temporariness and precarity into our, uh, our policies. 
And so in, but migrant care, but care work and migrant care work has always been a staple in our economy from when the very beginning of colonialism, when we brought governesses and, and women to come and watch our children, later on to the middle of the 20th century with the West Indian domestic scheme, and later on in 1992 when we established the Live-In Caregiver Program. But what's also important to know is that care, care workers and women have been organizing and advocating for employment-based social protections also as a consistent force throughout this time period. So as you can see, this policy landscape is highly dynamic. Uh, and, uh, and it's constantly changing. The Live and Caregiver program has, cha been ch has arrived, it was amended, it was canceled, a new program started, then that new program was announced as a pilot and changed the year after. And we've continued to kind of create these overhauls and reviews. And this program constantly changes. And what that does by reinforcing precarity in these racialized migrant women's lives is that there's constant confusion. We have women who are here under three different program envelopes right now with different rules and eligibility. And with that constant confusion, that makes it ripe for exploitation by both employers uh, and recruiters. So, and I think what's most importantly, one of the key things that has changed over this timeline is what was once a pathway to permanence for live-in caregivers is no longer. We have now turned it into a lottery system with fixed numbers that usually fill up within the first, you know, three days of, a, of an allotment. And not only is it not like a pathway to permanence, but it results in people falling in between the cracks and becoming undocumented. And so this is all part of the system that gets reinforced. Um, so how do you succeed with such a shifting landscape? And this is really what adaptive strategy talks about. You can see that the landscape is constantly changing. So for organizations to be successful, like I would say the Caregivers Action Center and migrant workers have been, they are able to adapt and be nimble. And they do that in a couple of ways. One, they have a long-term goal that they are pursuing. I think I'll use that one. They have a long-term goal that they are pursuing. And that long-term goal helps them make decisions on tangible interim outcomes. How to make choices on shorter goals is very important to have a good set of uh, long-term direction and a vision. They're able to evolve and adapt. And part of that is because they work so closely with community, they can hear from community about their lived experience and understand really fast what is the impact of these policies that people are having in their everyday lives or what's equally interesting, what experience have these women had of these policies in other countries that are now being imported over to Canada? And so that gives them such a level of intelligence, legitimacy, and credibility that enables them to build that credibility and influence government. So the Caregivers Action Center, one of the organizations I work with, was started in 2007 as a peer-led network uh, that was made up of current and former live-in caregivers and allies, and their membership has grown from 100 active members and thousands of relationships that are nurtured through its hotline, English language classes, and immigration rights workshops. And in their self-organizing, they've managed to submit policy submissions, deputations, briefing notes, protests, support community mobilization and public awareness, and that has enabled them to influence the elimination of recruitment fees, uh, the elimination of the living requirement of caregivers, admission requirements, project program eligibility, and repealing the four in, four rule, which was where migrant workers could work here for four years, and then they had to leave for four years, and then they could come back, which again, created this level of uh, permanent precarity and increased the level of undocumented people in Canada. But their changes and their work aren't just technical. They're also changing narrative and mental models, how care work is valued, how we think about the work of care work, and making visible the critical role that they play in our society and economy to function. In 2021, the Caregivers Action Center merged with Migrant Workers Alliance for Change to work in coordination with other migrant-led organizations that face similar structures and barriers and also have precarity in their employment and immigration status. And I find this fascinating because this is about a vision of solidarity and unity among migrants, and that they're no longer gonna be fragmented by the employment streams that we put under. 
put them under, and they're, they're recruited under, and then they fall in between the cracks of. Instead, it's now become a collective struggle of working class people around the world, and it's rooted locally, and it's rooted globally in their work. And what's all of a sudden become a group of 10,000 women has turned into a group of almost a million migrants who are fighting for the same things, for economic, legal, and uh, civil rights, including immigration status and residency. During the pandemic, we could see the collective power that they did through rapid analysis of all these policy changes that while they were impacting us, they were also really impacting migrant workers. And not everyone was thinking about what that impact of not being able to leave the country or enter the country was going to have. Or if no one was hiring someone and you couldn't get your, your work requirements and you only had one year to get enough work requirements or else your work permit is rescinded, that almost resulted in 52,000 international students being deported because they hadn't met their uh, work requirements. But MWAC, along with its colleagues of others, uh, advocated and changed those things, including uh, increasing the hours that workers are legally allowed to work under international, as international students. So, in closing, for the Caregivers Action Center, Migrant Workers Alliance for Change, and their close allies, Workers Action Center and Ontario Employment and Education Resource Center, adaptation is survival. It's how they keep abreast, and they have to keep abreast of policies that are federal, provincial, and municipal. They have to focus on care workers, farm workers, international students, migrant students, and undocumented. And it's their nimbleness to survive and thrive through these twists and turns that have enabled them to have such an impact on public policy. And as shared in a focus group, and now I have to read it with, uh, take off my eyes, and <laughs> read it close by. In a focus group, they said, it's sort of like a very long game of chess maybe one that never ends, quite frankly. We are building a movement for change, for people's rights and dignity, and the ability to get decent work. Every research project and campaign is a little move on a big chessboard. Hopefully it helped us expand our network or get some powerful new ally on board. Sometimes if we are lucky, it ends up in a policy change, which leads to another. But you can't be sure, can you? But that's fundamentally what this work is like. My second story is uh, about niche strategies. And this is about the Canada Learning Bond. So I don't know how many of you know about the Canada Learning Bond. If you have a child, you might be more familiar. And actually, this is the first year, well, unless you were fast-tracked, uh, this is the first year that those with a Canada Learning Bond are probably entering university or post-secondary education. So a Canada Learning Bond is a $2,000 federal government contribution that's given to low-income children over 15 years to their Registered Education Savings Plan, RESPs. There's no enrollment fees, no contribution required, and it's sheltered from clawbacks from social assistance, which is significant uh, if you're on welfare. It was introduced in 2004 to incentivize low-income families to save. RESPs is the primary policy tool of the Canadian Education Savings Policy. So the Canada Learning Bond complements the Canadian Education Savings Grant, which is a matching fund of up to $7,200 of federal dollars that can go into accounts. So this can be up to $9,000 for low-income families, but it requires that you have a registered education savings plan. And up until about 2004, RESPs were skewed to upper, middle, and high-income families. Only about 16,000, 16% of families had them in Canada, which really made our education savings policy, uh, you know, a policy for well-off families. So in 2008, oh no, but first I'll go. So one of the key things that makes this about certainty is, as I said, education savings can have a transformative impact in someone's life. We know that people are more likely to think that they can go to school, which helps them participate better in school if they know that there's savings there. They're more likely to attend, they're more likely to graduate, and post-secondary education is a way to break the cycle of poverty. So this transformative education opportunity is being missed out by low-income families. In 2018, in 2008, the Canada Learning Bond had plateaued to about 18%. And that means millions of dollars were being sitting idle in federal accounts. 880,000 children were not accessing this fund. So the Omega Foundation, a private foundation with a history in microfinance and poverty reduction in Canada, decided to focus their resources and attention to take this challenge on. And they, with the goal of increasing the Canada Learning Bond take-up rate from 20% to 40%, which they did in just under 10 years. 
So early on, they partnered with community to do some re rapid action research and engage newcomer families to understand why they weren't, what was their relationship with the RESP and the Canada Learning Bond. And one of the organizations they worked with was Working Women Community Centre, where I was working. So I worked closely on this project with Omega over the years. And in that research, uh, we engaged some newcomer women, we met with about 300 families in 15 different community settings in a range of languages, and we learned, you know, the issues were about awareness and access. But what was really interesting was the nuance of those issues, and it was the nuance that helped guide our work over the next 10 years. So Smart Saver started in 2010. It's a marketing pilot with a series of small interventions that was going to increase awareness and knowledge about the Canada Learning Bond and RESPs in Toronto. Omega had one clear goal. It wanted to increase the take-up rate and help low-income families save so that children could attend post-secondary education. And it continually tested its approach using data to assess how well things were working and to adapt accordingly. And it focused on the things that we had learned. We learned that most families didn't know about the Canada Learning Bond, uh, and, only though, and those that did knew about these financial products called scholarship programs, which what they heard were these were highly uh, restrictive. You they were middle-class products. You had uh, associated enrollment fees, you had, minimum co you had mandatory contributions, and if you couldn't make your contribution, it was quite punitive, and you couldn't get the money back. And so this was the first kind of anchoring experience that low-income families had with this product. And it, for them, it was something that they did not want to advance. And the interesting thing, too, about these scholarship programs was that they recruited, they outreached, and they hired uh, a lot of newcomer immigrant men as sales commission, working on sales as commission. And also, because, so for the community, it was also one of those things that this was a product that hired their husbands, and that this was something that was outreaching, and they could learn about it in their own language. And so there were some really mixed relationships about the scholarship program and RESPs. We also heard that even when families went to the bank to ask about it, the banks didn't know about Canada Learning Bonds. This wasn't a product that banks got a commission on. And so maybe they weren't incentivized to learn a lot about these products. Now they know. Now you'll see these pictures everywhere. But in 2004 and 2008, there wasn't that familiarity. They too associated RESPs with middle and upper middle class families. When you would go to the community organizations, community organizations didn't know about it. They're like, money, we work on social service stuff. Money is economic stuff. But also, what we heard was, Families, uh, community workers thought that they were also financial traps and predatory, and that they didn't want to talk to their clients about things that they didn't understand. But most importantly, they really didn't want to talk about money and savings with families, because those are really uncomfortable things. There's a lot of trauma for a lot of people talking about money, and especially if you're low income. And so you didn't want to have those relationships talking about money, and especially when communities are struggling already. So. To be able to deal with awareness on all of these things, we had to come up with multiple strategies. Uh, and finally, I would say, so one of the key things that they did was they developed a whole bunch of information and flyers and information. And in 2011, uh, Omega sent out 250,000 flyers to students all across the Toronto District School Board, and there was minimal uptake. And, and so part of that was we commissioned some re they commissioned some research to figure out why and realized that no one trusted this idea of free money, no strings attached. It felt very sketchy. And so what they really needed to do was get community to give it their stamp of approval. And so we worked over the next 10 years with interagency networks, uh, community tables, really trying to get them to understand and promote the learning bond. In over three years, uh, Smart Saver worked with... Uh, See, what was it? It was about 10,000 people trained and familiar with the Canada Learning Bond in over 1,000 community settings. And it was fascinating to me because while we were doing all this outreach, we were trying to inform families that they were available in clinics and, and sign up forms. The federal government actually knows everyone who is eligible. In fact, they could already sign them up right now. They know that. But they didn't. We tried, but they didn't. But instead, what it gave was an incredible access to data that we were able to look by postal code every quarter and see whether sign-up rates had increased. And that really helped us understand our outreach and track, our, track what was working. 
And so we worked closely with teachers, social workers, and community organizations. We developed these materials. They were translated in multiple languages, over 16. Uh, we developed, they developed videos, infographics, fact sheets, scorecards. And what we began to see was that the increase was taking, increase was picking up. The other key issue, of course, wasn't just awareness, it was access. And access was something that needed to be focused on a level of scale. There were some significant barriers to the Canada Learning Bond. One, you needed a SIN card. To get a SIN card, you need a birth certificate. And to get a birth certificate, you need to pay $25. This was not always a priority for low-income families. So, but if we didn't respond to that, then we wouldn't get take up at scale. So part of the advocacy that Omega did was working on those issues. And just this past year, they eliminated the birth certificate fund for vulnerable families. Uh, a few years back, they increased RESP signups for the Canada Learning Bond as part of the birth certificate, part of the birth registry process that happens when you sign up online. They increased it from the four in one bundle to a five in one. And finally, they worked with banks. And that was a really key part because to go to get uh, RESP, you had to go into a bank, which is sometimes traumatizing. You had to set up an appointment. You had to have someone explain all these things to you. You had kids, you had time. This was very complicated. And so Omega worked with the banks and they agreed upon a shared portal that allowed families to go online, sign up, pick the financial institution of their choice, and then fill out all the stuff and then book an appointment that worked for them to go and sign the final paperwork. This was a pretty groundbreaking thing to have all these banks agree to it. So over this time, we've seen uh, that portal register uh, enroll up to 55,000 families. And that really is kind of like one number when you know that so many families have gone other ways to get it as well and told their families and colleagues about it. And we've also seen the Canada Learning Bond increase from 20% to over 40% with 1 .6, over 1.6 million families in it. This was uh, a really key project for me, and I learned a lot, not just about niche strategy, but I actually learned about what philanthropy can do and how philanthropy can share its power and work and empower community, and, and it can orchestrate impact and change systems. And I've taken both that model and mentorship uh, to guide me in my work today. Story number three. Uh, workforce development. I, oh, I must have Googled workforce development dozens of times when I started at Metcalf Foundation. What is workforce development? I was trying to understand whether it was just a new term for employment and skills training or if it represented a conceptually different idea. And in a way, it's kind of a bit of both. Uh, and there's a variety of definitions. Um, and I think part of that is each definition comes from a different perspective. For community, workforce development is an anti-poverty reduction strategy, an anti-poverty strategy. It's about focusing on low wage and low income and displaced workers and increasing their employment earnings and through education and skills development to prove access and advancement uh, to good jobs and get out of working poverty. For industry, it's about human capital and talent development to have training to have the workforce that you need to be competitive and uh, prosperous in the marketplace. And from a societal perspective, it's about regional prosperity, you know, maintaining a sustainable and competitive and prosperous society. And these can all be complementary, but they're also kind of competing paradigms that have a web of activities and programs and policies that are rooted in a geography and can be very confusing to navigate. From an anti-poverty perspective, it's about moving out of poverty. And that's not just about fixing the individual. That's about changing jobs, having better wages, workplace discrimination, addressing racism, having relevant uh, training, and navigating that service delivery uh, landscape. But it's also about other things too, and not just work. It's about housing and health and trauma and debt and this fraying safety net. And all of that against the backdrop of these macro forces, and we could throw in, if it's not there already, inflation uh, in that. And there's also this underlying mental model about how we view poverty and how we think about people who are poor. And so workforce development kind of encompasses these things. So 
It might puzzle you on why I'm putting it in an integrated strategy as opposed to an ecosystem strategy, which is a much more kind of complex thing. And for me, that's because this is about community struggles. And I think that workforce development as a high-performing workforce development system is a responsibility for institutions. It is not fair to put that on the shoulders of the community-based sector to figure out and navigate this complicated workforce system and make it high-performing. So in another conversation, on another story, I would talk about workforce development from an ecosystem, but I really want to focus on the community-based work that's happening here. So one of the organizations that I work with, and I'm really fortunate to work with some of the most cutting edge workforce intermediaries uh, in Toronto that are really showing a different way of doing these things. And this is the organization Building Up. And Building Up is uh, started in 2015, and it's an organization that uh, focuses, it started off with, uh, a, so it focuses on uh, trying to create skills trade to, for people in the construction industry. It started off with 30 participants, and it's now grown to having over just under 40 staff and supporting just over 50, uh, 50 participants over the years. And what's interesting with this organization is that they figured very early on that they needed to focus on an integrated strategy. So this is an image that came, uh, that was sketched out by the executive director and founder of Building Up. Uh, in this leadership academy that uh, Metcalf, the Counseling Foundation, and Aspen Institute uh, supported and that I ran called the Toronto Sector Skills Academy. And we had people kind of sketch out their strategy map to think about their work. And already early on, you can see that there's this understanding of integrated work. And it's about how do we sequence and combine and fit these things to work. And early on, there's this acknowledgement that it's non-linear. You're going to go up and down these ladders. And that part of equity in this work is starting where people are at, figuring out where you're at and figuring out where they want to go. Not where you want them to go, but where they want to go. And then figuring out how can you best support them and what can you consistently offer. So as a social enterprise, it has grown and it focuses on a range of things. It provides skilled training and support. And part of the secret of its model, well, not secret, part of the key component of its model is earning and learning, that people get paid while they take training. And that's really significant because if you're low income and you've decided to go into training, it's important to have funding that's able to, to, to enable you to continue to pay your bills and to focus on this work so that you don't have to make that choice. Should I try to get training and do better in, my, and do better in the labor market? Or do I need to kind of continue in this uh, minimum wage job? So it started off as doing replacing toilets and doing other energy retrofits and social housing. And now it's a significant pipeline into community benefits projects, bringing workers into unions, Layuna, it's been part of the Region Park revitalization, Crosslinks, but they also have built relationships with small and medium enterprises because not everyone's cut out for labor. And so they know to really support the workers that they're with, they have to find out what's the best employer to support them. And so that's part of that integrated strategy, understanding what's the right sequence, what's the right fit, and how are we going to put all those pieces together. They have many best practices, so there's certainty in their model. They have a dual customer approach. They think of workers and employers as customers. They have a strong industry focus. Uh, they integrate uh, industry knowledge into their model. And they're also highly experiential, and they have this culture of caring and support and wraparound supports. And it's that wraparound supports that's really interesting to see also how they do this coordination. Because there's lots of things that people need to succeed in case management. Mental health, they need access to get a driver's license, they need to figure out phone, get tools, uh, you know, do, deal with unpaid taxes so they can access an apprentice loan. There's all these things that have to be figured out. And so this is part of that integration model. Part of their model also enables uh, workers who deal with seasonal unemployment, because that's part of the cycle of the construction industry, that they're able to kind of come back to building up and find work for those gaps. Again, creating that level of stability so that if you're not working, you know you can go back to, social, uh, to the social enterprise building up and pick up some shifts and be able to continue to pay your bills. In such a short time, this organization has managed to do incredible things. And as I said, they've got 500 uh, participants that they've supported, 86 of whom are 86% are still in uh, employment, and 65% have managed to have long-term employment. 
So, integration strategy is what is needed. And I think the final part I'd add about this is as a social enterprise, it's able to have its own revenues, to have, it, to have more control over its ability to coordinate and move things along. And because one of the challenges is, is that they should scale up, they've had to deal with that tension of scale, that if they scale too high, they're going to lose that human-centered approach. And there's sometimes this idea that a social enterprise can become big enough where they won't need the revenue of government or philanthropy. But if they want to maintain that human-centered, person-client-focused approach, they know that they're always going to need those other revenue sources and they can't scale too large. So what they've done to increase their impact is work in more of an orchestrated system and more of an ecosystem. And they're starting to do that with organizations like Raising the Roof and Parkdale Neighborhood Land Trust, which in itself could be another story, but it's not for today. So I will leave it there. My final story is Parkdale Community uh, Wealth. So I love Parkdale. I first got to know Parkdale about 15 years ago uh, volunteering as a tutor with Parkdale Project Read. Uh, I was working as a tutor there. Uh, it's a literacy organization, and then I moved and I joined the board as co-chair. And like many things in Parkdale, it had a unique governance structure. The organization was a collective amongst staff. There was no boss or hierarchy. Uh, and as a board, uh, a third of our members were learners of the organization. So in trying to figure out how to be more inclusive and how to have better board meetings that actually uh, were, were not uh, tokenistic and not dismissive, uh, we got a grant, a Metcalf grant, uh, and we explored different ideas of how to uh, build out new governance mechanisms. And what was interesting were these ideas actually benefited everyone. We started off our meeting reading the minutes. And so everyone who was late, which were usually the non-learners, could come in late because they'd read the minutes, but it was a great way to set the meeting. We began to use infographics for budgets. We invented these little toggles that were red and green so that if people wanted to speak, they could flip them up and we could invite them in. And so it was less intimidating as a process. These are small things, but again, this is what that governance looks like. So we tested those things out. We thought they were very interesting. We said, oh, we should share this with PARC. PARC is another organization that works with homeless and street-involved uh, individuals in Parkdale and, uh, and a, through their drop-in and other social services and community development supports that they offer. And they also had a board that was made up of half of, uh, half of their members. And so we shared our uh, governance mechanisms with them. And then when I got to join Metcalf, I got to meet a whole bunch of other organizations in Parkdale. I got to meet Working for Change that runs social enterprises for consumers and survivors of uh, mental health and violence. I got to meet with... Uh, um, Parkdale Neighborhood Land Trust. I got, well, not yet. I got to meet with Park, West End, uh, Food Co-op, and Greenest City. And early on, they were working on projects around co-op, around exploring these kind of alternative mechanisms for an economy. One of them was co-op cred, where they developed this alternative currency that could be used uh, in the food co-op. They also explored a market in the garden uh, that they had and how that could work. And they were also, at those days, exploring these early ideas around establishing a community land trust. What would be an alternative mechanism for the community accumulation of wealth? So how wealth could be retained and then redistributed for low-income people and marginalized groups in the neighborhood. So this was a really rich neighborhood of alternative economy activities. West End Food Co-op had even done uh, a community bond in their facilities. I was also part of the work that was with Public Health and Park as we were exploring a food procurement, local food and distribution procurement. It was a really ripe ecosystem that was flourishing. And all of this was to build community wealth. And community wealth um, was kind of coined by the Democracy Collective, uh, an organization in the United States. And it's about building local shared wealth through intentional place-based strategies that localize investments into community-driven entities that support broad-based and democratic ownership over capital. And it was interesting to see what this actually meant in, uh, prog in process. And so over the years, through this exploration and collaboration, a network of 30 organizations and over hundreds of residents have come together to create a shared vision and a shared strategy and a community plan, the Parkdale People's Economy. And it's this Parkdale People's Economy that is really helping create 
that ecosystem and underpin that ecosystem so that there's shared vision of people working together. And it doesn't mean that organizations aren't doing their own thing. In fact, there's lots of niche and integrated strategies that are still happening. The health center, the legal clinic, those are all examples of niche and integrated strategies. But what they're doing is that they're working together and they're mutually reinforcing, and they're also there to help one another out and provide this mutual aid when people need all hands on deck, which we saw with things around the closing of the Parkdale Legal Clinic space or when we saw with uh, evictions and uh, evictions of uh, renters in Parkdale, the organizations come together. One of the examples that came and was born through this ecosystem, as I mentioned, is the Parkdale Neighborhood Land Trust. So it's great to have some of you here today uh, with this. The Parkdale Neighborhood Land Trust is led by residents and organizations, and it has a vision of redefining how land is used and developed. They, they, own the land, and they assure that its needs are met by community by leasing it to nonprofits and other organizations for affordable space and off for affordable housing and offer urban agriculture and open space. And in only 10 years, the Parkdale Neighborhood Land Trust has gone from being an idea and a governance model of people sitting around a table and thinking about bylaws to actually owning land, actually owning land. And throughout it all, they have centered the voice of residents and communities and people who experience these issues of poverty, of homelessness, of food insecurity, marginalization and stig stigmatization. And now, the Parkdale Neighborhood Land Trust owns, now I'm gonna lose my sticky tab, but that's okay. Uh, Parkdale Neighborhood Land Trust owns 84 uh, units that provide about 204 uh, units of housing. In less than 10 years, it now has 204 units of housing. And this has come because it's had a long-term vision, because these organizations have worked in orchestration together. And the factors for their success and momentum are not just these shared values, but the orchestration that works over and over again. And this community-based research that grounds their insights, that they learn about what's happening from their community. Their research reinforces their community partners, and their community partners' research reinforces their work. And they're able to apply this research and their experience and address things not just at a local level, but also at broader systems level. And their work has been able to address some fundamental barriers on how we can be able to have more, uh, preserve more affordable housing. And one of them significantly was the multi-unit residential acquisition program that was just developed by the City of Toronto. And this is a non-market, uh, a fund for non-market public and community-based rental housing. And its whole purpose is to preserve existing supply of affordable rental and take it out of the speculative market. And even seeing that language of taking it out of the speculative market on the city website just kind of gives me uh, the goosebumps. And I know that so much of that is because of the work of the Parkdale Neighborhood Land Trust, but also because of the work of that whole community. And they don't just say, oh, it's us. They, oh, it's me. They say, oh, it's us coming together as a community. So, this work is long-term for an ecosystem, and it requires a long-term vision. And it's complex, and you need to orchestrate and work together. And I think in closing, I'll say that the quote that I heard in one of the most recent Parkdale People Economy reports also speaks to, I think, what we need in our work. What is at stake now is the future of Parkdale. Parkdale's diversity, affordable, affordability, and inclusivity are increasingly at risk and hinge on equitable outcomes in neighborhood development and improvement. We know change happens, but we know that how change happens is not inevitable. Strategies and policy tools to guide neighborhood development do exist. What is needed then is to explore how we marshal those strategies and work together to build a healthy, inclusive, and just neighborhood. This is why this community planning initiative is vital and timely. So, these are my four stories. I hope that you've enjoyed them. There's a little like a four stories plus one, of course, because I'm the plus one, and this is a bit of my own ecosystem orchestration strategy. I hope you've enjoyed what I've been working on for the last 10 weeks or 10 years, depending on how you slice it or dice it. And uh, thanks again for coming. There you go.